In this four-part lecture, I would like to explore some connections between the early development of mass or popular schooling, psychometric testing, and eugenics. The aim is to explore some of the problematic assumptions that were built into modern education systems in the decades around the turn of the 19th century. This lecture builds on the previous podcast titled Mass Schooling and Modern Examination. It also draws from the book Benign Violence, Education in and Beyond the Age of Reason, published by Palgrave Macmillan. Mass schooling, psychometric testing and eugenics were all developed at a similar time. Indeed, eugenics helped establish the argument for psychometric testing and set in place some of its basic assumptions. Psychometric testing, in turn, helped produce principles of examination and population control that guided the development of mass schooling. The term eugenics was first coined by Francis Galton in 1883. Francis Galton was Charles Darwin's half-cousin and sought to apply evolutionary principles to human beings. Galton, like Darwin to some extent, viewed human populations in terms of their breeding potential, the potential, as he saw it, to develop so-called better characteristics. Eugenics was the science of selective breeding to improve human characteristics. Eugenics is today a much discredited idea. It is widely regarded as a pseudoscience and has been attacked by those within and outside the scientific community for its inbuilt racism and white supremacism. There are, nonetheless, still some advocates of eugenics about. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, by contrast, many felt that it was a legitimate science. Eugenics had a huge influence on the early development of statistical science and played a role too in political developments, taken up not only by the Nazis, but also by many states in the USA, such as California, which used eugenic ideas to justify mass sterilization programs, targeting women in particular who were judged by their doctors to be inferior in some way. It was and remains a hateful perspective on human life. One of the characteristics that Galton and other eugenicists wanted to improve was individual intelligence. They did not yet use the word but had a range of terms, such as mental energy or mental force. The idea that each individual has something, a single characteristic, that could be measured and identified with a number, began as a hypothesis. Much of the early work in eugenics and the early development of psychometric testing was based on that hypothesis, on the presumed existence of a trait or characteristic that could be measured and, if measured, then also improved. It was also hypothesized that this thing, which came to be known as intelligence, was largely hereditary, and therefore that those who have higher intelligence should be encouraged to have more children than those with lower intelligence. The problem for people like Galton is that it remained a hypothesis. Early eugenicists were unable to measure this thing, this presumed mental energy, that they assumed each individual apparently has to varying degrees. So eugenicists attempted to measure intelligence indirectly by various proxies, such as skull shape or size, or tests that recorded reaction time. The real leap forward, if we can call it that, for mental testing came from elsewhere. The first intelligence test was developed by someone who was not a eugenicist, but whose ideas would be quickly taken up by those who were. In the early 20th century, the French psychologist Alfred Binet developed what would become the first intelligence test. Recently enacted French law required that all children be given a public education, including those who were deemed subnormal. The term subnormal is significant and worth dwelling upon. It assumes that there is some kind of norm that people, in this case children, can be judged to be below. Although we might, uh, and most probably would, reject the label subnormal today in most contexts, 
and think that the idea of the subnormal child is itself a hateful idea. Children are still judged to this very day according to statistical and psychological norms. In many cases, it is the language that has been adjusted. So instead, we might refer to a child who is performing below expectations or the child who is falling behind. The language might be different, but the child in question is still being judged against norms, often population norms, that are produced by statistical analysis. In the early 20th century, the subnormal child appeared as a category because schooling had recently been extended to the entire population. The so-called subnormal child appeared here in France as a type of child who was unable to cope with in mainstream institutions. In this broad category, uh, or for this broad category, the French state sought to provide specialist schools. Whatever we might think of what was happening here in terms of how children were being conceptualized and divided, it is worth noting that on a mundane but nonetheless very important level, this was an administrative problem and it produced an administrative innovation. This was the problem of allocating those children who were considered to be on the borderlines of normality. As uh, the member of a French commission appointed in 1904 to investigate the problem, Binet found that the current di diagnostic procedures uh, were woefully unreliable. The assignment of children was fraught with confusion and error. Many children were being misjudged and misallocated. Hence, from Binet's perspective, improved diagnostic tools were urgently required, in particular to resolve borderline cases. So, along with Theodore Simon, Binet devised a test, which came to be the Binet-Simon test, that would perform these classifications more precisely. This test was published in 1905, revised in 1908, and again in 1911, just before Binet's death. Now the reason this historical context is important is because it helps explain where some of the first assumptions behind the concept of intelligence originated. They were institutional assumptions. Up until this point, mental energy, mental capacity or intelligence or whatever you call it, was still a hypothesis. What the French school system presented here were a set of ideas that would turn this hypothesis into a more stable and measurable idea. As I and others have argued, the conceptual architectures of mental testing were first found within the institutions of mass schooling. These institutions had already generated norms of conduct and performance and, as a result, systems of exclusion. They had organised behavioural space establishing the standards against which variations between children could be charted. And so, within and because of these institutional confines, a new category of child emerged who, although appearing fully functional in other settings, did not seem able to benefit from institutional instruction. These children, who had done little except fail to fit within a prefigured environment, came to be known as subnormal. As a category, as a group, subnormal and borderline children only appeared because of the nature of schools at that point and the assumptions those institutions carried as to how children learn and develop. So the criteria for separating out such children were created by that environment. These were the criteria Binet used. He used criteria that could be derived from the artificial context of schooling with its arbitrary codes of conduct and favoured activities. The tasks in the Binet-Simon test were arranged according to the assumed and institutionally specific development of a normal child. According to this framework, a normal child of, say, five years of age would have an equivalent mental level of five years, whereas a child with arrested development would have a mental level lower than the chronological age. The tasks used in the Binet-Simon test were standardised on a population of 50 pre-chosen normal and 45 pre-chosen subnormal children. 
in the test, the examiner proceeded through a hierarchy of activities with the first group of so-called subnormal children engineered to drop out at a mental age of two years, the second group managing questions uh, for a preset engineered category of two to five years, and the last borderline group passing tests that a so-called normal child of five to 11 years would be able to complete. If the chronological age and the test age matched up, they were judged to be normal for their age. If the chronological age was higher than the test age, they were deemed uh, subnormal. This introduction of age-related tasks, tasks corresponding to the assumed development of a normal child, was a key development. It was now possible to, in, uh, to assign an intellectual level to the individual, which later became known as his or her mental age. I will explore the further development and larger consequences of mental testing in part two.